What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Eastgate Chat Podcast with Evolve. Are we going to use the technology from what's on the Hayden series? It's changing that whole final drive ratio. Surfing this endless wave through Tokyo. Electric skateboarding is like breaking through. Every time I wanted to drink, I would step on this board. I heard somebody say, hey, Dan. <laughs> 100%. We'd love to build our own specialized e-skate track. I mean, the, the amount of thought that went into that. I want to talk about how it affected the riders. So I went skating with Tony Hawk. Oh, what? Yeah. Really? There's a whole new product line. I've done things I never thought I'd be able to do because of electric skateboarding. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Eastgate Chat Podcast. And on this one, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about all things mental health and mental well-being to do with skate and just general life. We're going to be talking with someone super cool, Dr. Mikey Newhouse. How are you doing? I'm well, Matt. Thank you. How are you? Amazing. Top of the world. Why don't we get stuck in and tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and the kind of people that you work with. Absolutely. So as you said, my name is Dr. Micah. Um, I'm a psychologist by trade, but these days I work predominantly as a speaker and as a coach. So I basically help people and organizations to understand what humans need to flourish or cultivate mental well-being so they can realize their potential and create impacts that excite them. So that's kind of what I do these days. And I've kind of established myself as digital nomad over the last couple of years. So I'm currently traveling the world while doing my work and I love it. We spoke a little bit offline about sort of mental well-being versus mental illness um, and them being sort of two separate things. Can you tell us a little bit about your views on that? Yeah, I appreciate that because it's so important, I think, that we get this right. Because the thing is that Usually when we talk about mental health, what most people mean is mental illness. So when I say mental health, most people think about depression or anxiety or borderline personality disorder or something like that. But the thing is that mental health, just like physical health, is way more than the absence of mental illness. We need to have the absence of mental illness, of course, but we also need to have presence of mental well-being. And that is a synonym for flourishing. So that, obviously I'm the founder of the Flourishing Doc, that is exactly what I help people with, cultivate their mental well-being. So mental health is two things, absence of mental illness and presence of mental well-being. And the important thing is just that we can cultivate that mental well-being in our everyday lives. And it's so important we do that because not only does it help prevent mental illness as well, but it gives us a sense of fulfillment and meaning in life and accomplishment and so forth. And it also makes us way more resilient so that when we do develop a mental illness, we are a lot more likely to be able to overcome that. Does that make sense? I find myself talking about this a little bit in my personal life is that correlation between illness and health. And I think in the last few years, there's definitely been a good push towards breaking the stigma of talking about mental health, which is fantastic, super important. But what that's come with is a lot of people talking about anxiety and depression and of course, suicide, which is a big, heavy topic. So when you start talking about that, it sort of pushes into the this darker conversation with a bit of a negative realm, and that's a stigma we're trying to break. But what it's also doing is, yeah, talking about illness in the same space or the same realm as well-being. So when the well-being gets pulled into the dark, negative suicide conversation, it doesn't do the stigma on that side of things a lot of favours. So what we want to talk about is things of how can I be happier day to day? What little things can I do for my mental health, my mental fitness that will help me in the long run without being <laughs> the, the second stigma on that, if that makes sense? Absolutely. And I love that you brought this up, Maddie, because it's so true. We want to get rid of the stigma. But the thing is, mental health is actually so cool because incomplete mental health or positive mental health, if we consider mental health to be both the absence of mental illness and the presence of mental well-being, is actually so cool because you just mentioned the keyword. It's where we find happiness and not that just that eerie, cheery, you know, laughing kind of uh, short lasting happiness, but that 
feeling of deep fulfillment and accomplishment and sense of purpose and living with intention and so forth. So mental health is actually really cool. Now you asked, how can we actually accomplish that or how can we cultivate that? Well, the thing is, the first step is always understanding what the concept is about, right? So flourishing or mental well-being um, depends sort of what research model you want to look at. Um, I'm a big fan of the work by Professor Corey Keyes. Um, it's probably the most, um, what's the word? most established model out there um, and that basically says that mental well-being is found at the intersection of emotional psychological and social well-being now what do those terms mean emotional well-being is when it's basically another word for hedonic happiness so moments of joy and pleasure and also though life satisfaction so cognitive evaluation of what do I want and need in my life and to what extent have I already accomplished that? So that's emotional well-being. Sometimes gets a little bit of a bad reputation because hedonism, right? It's like, oh, materialist, materialistic wealth or, you know, just uh, chasing pleasures or whatever. But we, we do actually need that to get us through every day in life because let's face it, life can be tough, right? So that's emotional well-being. Psychological well-being is the more that deeper level of happiness, sometimes also referred to as eudaimonia or eudaimonic happiness. So those are things like feeling like we're accomplishing something in life. So learning new skills, mastering the skills, things that you're good at, um, finding meaning and purpose, feeling like we can actually live our purpose. So this goes really deep because it means that we need to understand exactly who we are and what our values are, what is most important to us in life, how do we want to show up in life and being able to work towards that. So this is all about personal growth, which is so important for us humans, for our psyche. And then the last one, social well-being is again super important and it's one that we often forget about it's all about feeling connected to other people but also feeling like you're part of something bigger that might be a community uh, a skate community <laughs> but also feeling like we can contribute and give back to the world so again super important and there's some fascinating research just around social well-being out there that shows that Having a good level of social well-being is actually even more important when it comes to premature mortality than how much tobacco we smoke or how much alcohol we drink and so forth. And I, and I don't want to encourage your listeners to smoke as much as they want or drink as much as they want. But just understanding how important it is that we seek good quality connection because it's really important for our mental health. It's so interesting to hear someone like you, like as a professional, lay out all those things because I feel like over the years I've had so many conversations with um, like customers talking about each of those individual points and they're saying, I skate because of X. And I guess they don't, they don't know it in, in terms of this list of things you have to do to have good mental health. But yeah. they're being invigorated by the skating and it's sort of pushing one of those buttons so the amount of times i've heard um <laughs> i've heard these skaters say my board is my therapist or my board is my meditation or my board is <laughs> my antidepressant meds is like it's a lot it seems always like it's an escape or it's just like a little bit of quiet time or on the flip side it's it's a community thing and it's about engaging with like other people who like the same thing so it's very interesting to hear all those love, core things yeah i love that you know some of your clients call their boards their therapist because it's so on point you know i mean you just said you know whether it's to escape something and that again has straight away a negative connotation but it shouldn't because what are we escaping probably just our own monkey minds you know because when we skate there are so much goodness in skating you know that starting off with being physically active, but also we go outdoors, we go outside to skate, right? <laughs> and that is so important, not only to get daylight and you know, all the feel good hormones that or neurotransmitters like endorphin that come with moving our body and getting that sunlight or daylight. Um, but also, for example, forward emulation. So that's a fancy word for saying moving your body through space. 
has a calming effect directly onto our onto our brain or the amygdala you know that uh, part of our brain that is responsible for feeling anxious so often or that fight or flight response so just moving through space because our eyes can see objects come and go that because our optic nerve is connected obviously to our brain our eyes are like the only part of our brain that's kind of popping outside of our head <laughs> but it sort of forms part of that and um, because of that movement it has a directly calming effect on that fight or flight center of our brain so even that is so calming and you know emotionally regulating for us to do that but then often also people skate and they instantly connect with their community as well so here we have the social well-being com component as well so or people find their flow as they're skating you know because you kind of have to be focused you have to be in the moment and focus on you know keeping your balance and all the other things that i wouldn't know anything about because i don't skate <laughs> But, you know, you have that instant feedback, you know, through your entire body of how you're keeping your body on the board, you know, how you're moving through space and so forth. And that holds the potential for us to find flow, you know, that flow experience of just being completely in the moment, completely zoning out of everything else, being hyper focused, but having that warped sense of time and again, flow is a key element of psychological well-being we need those moments of flow because what they are is deep engagement in life that is the opposite of being on autopilot you know and feeling like groundhog day happening over and over again so there are so many therapeutic effects of skating so i love that some of your clients call their skateboard the therapist because it's spot on <laughs> when i said like escapism i mean like let's be real life is hard you know you got the pressures of work careers deadlines you might be raising kids you know you got to pay rent so it's just nice to have a quiet minute um and i guess that's what hobbies are for a lot of people so whether it be skating or surfing or knitting or whatever it is just to have something where you're not trying to achieve anything or not really trying to prove anything um I think it's pretty important. How many people are sort of missing that from their life and then what impact does that have on them? Great question because it has a huge impact because as you said, we all need that outlet and it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, I spoke about skating also so highly because it has the added benef benefit of us moving physically. So getting that physical activity and getting outdoors. So they are super healthy components in and of them by themselves. Um, but hobbies, so that, that feeling of, first of all, having an avenue that can provide that experience of flow super important and we can find that in our hobbies but also often hobbies uh, become the things that we intrinsically love doing right because why would they otherwise be a hobby of ours right so we love doing them so usually it's something we're already good at and we know that playing to our strength doing activities while using our strengths is super good for us um, but also we get to live our passions. And again, it's all part of that psychological well-being. Now, the thing is that as we become adults, we realize, oh, crap, we've got to earn money, right? So we choose jobs that often mm, don't just provide a means for us to play to our strengths and maybe also align with our passions but sometimes what falls into that equation of you know do i go for this job or that job is how much money can i earn is it some somewhere where i can actually build a career are there even any jobs that pay any money in that field how easy is it to progress in that career and so forth so sometimes or very often to be quite honest we end up in careers that are not really aligned to our values or our strengths or our passions or any combination of that. And the problem is we spend about a third of our lives at work, right? Just in terms of you look at the time, most people obviously talking very general terms. So the problem is that we spend so much time at work and many of us spend so much time at work doing things that we are not passionate about, where we can't play to our own strengths and so forth. And that is very draining, especially if we do that for a very long time. So coming back to our hobbies, 
we don't need to pursue a career where we f can live our purpose. We don't need to do that. But for example, living our purpose and doing something meaningful is super important. So then it becomes even more important that we, that we participate in hobbies that can provide us with those feelings, right? Um, so spending time doing things that we love and are passionate about, you know, any kind of hobbies or where we can get an experience of flow are super important, especially for people who don't feel fulfilled by their careers. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting point because like all power to you, if you're one of those people with the big careers and you're loving it and you're passionate about it and you get so much fulfillment out of it, that's awesome. But realistically, that's not most people. Most people have a job, you know, they're, they go to work to make ends meet, get their money, and then they derive their passions and their fulfillment and all their value out of external things, you know, friends, families, hobbies like this, um, what, whatever it else people like to do. There's a million different things. Another thing we hear a lot of, and it's something that I think is sort of important in like living a, you know, a meaningful life is having some form of control over your life. If you're working in that job where you're just getting told what to do all day and, you know, your partner's running all over you, you, you lose that control and autonomy over your own life, which is crucial to being happy. Customers have said this to me time and time again, is part of what they like about skating is the ability to take control. Like it seems silly if you're comparing it to your whole life, but the ability to go out and go wherever you want, go whatever speed you want and just lose yourself and have control over something in your life is something that they find meaningful to the way they interact with, I guess, the product and the world. 100% can confirm that as a psychologist is called autonomy. We all have an innate human need to feel autonomous, to feel like we have a say over our, our own lives and to make choices that we make just because they're important to us and not because we live a life on someone else's terms. It's super important. Autonomy is one of the most vital elements for psychological well-being. Absolutely. So if you don't feel like you have autonomy or a say over your own life in many other areas in your life, absolutely go and chase those activities where you do get that experience. If we step away from the skating thing for just a sec, I'm sure there's like a lot of people listening that are interested in this. What can people do? to sort of take stock of their own life, engage where they're at in terms of mental well-being, what's making them happy, what's making them unhappy, and sort of how do you begin to map a path into a better state of mental well-being? Yeah, that's something I do all, pretty much all the time with any of my clients to start with because if you feel like you're not where you want to be, well, then you need to first of all understand where you are right now and where you want to go, and then we can build a path towards that right so in terms of taking stock and understanding where you're currently at i mean often what's used especially in coaching is a so-called wheel of life so basically um you know like you draw a circle and then you or like a pie chart and you divide it into all the pieces that you think are most important for you in your life so this can be your physical health and well-being your mental health and well-being your relationships your significant other your uh, finances whatever you can look at it that way, absolutely. And it's something that when I work with a client, I don't predefine those pie pieces, but I sort of work or elaborate them together with the client. But what I like to do more specifically is to go back to that model of, um, of well-being, mental well-being, where we know we need psychological well-being, emotional well-being, and social well-being. So we then look at those, I explain them to a client, and then we look at, okay, on a scale from one to 10, uh, where do you currently sit? How much joy do you experience in your everyday life? Or um, how accomplished do you feel? Or how much personal growth do you currently experience in your, um, in, in your life? Or uh, tell me about your social connections and so forth. So I like to use that as a baseline model to establish that. And then we look at opportunities to build and cultivate those aspects of mental well-being. What is often the most fundamental thing to also do in the beginning is to understand what are their strengths? Because as I mentioned before, we need to use our strengths 
for so many reasons, because when we use our strengths to accomplish goals, not only will we be more successful and better at accomplishing them, we will increase our chance of achieving them. We will also feel more fulfilled once we have achieved those goals, if we got to use our own strengths. So we look at our strengths, we understand them. We understand our passions for obvious reasons, and we also look at values. What is actually most important for you in your life? Because that is the crux of creating a life on your own terms because there are so many norms we just subconsciously learned by growing up in a certain society of what is good and what is worth striving for and so forth that we automatically create pathways in our lives to accomplish those goals that were kind of defined as good by society but that won't speak to our own values. And if we do that, and I've been there and done that, um, we will feel deeply fulfilled. You will end up in a situation where your life looks great and it feels crap. And that's, by the way, called also languishing, or it can be called languishing. So languishing is the opposite of flourishing or mental well-being. And that's a term a lot of your listeners might have heard throughout the pandemic too, is that feeling of Groundhog Day or living life on autopilot. You know, you're not quite depressed. You don't have a mental illness, but you have an absence of mental well-being. And often that's exactly what we experience when our life might look absolutely perfect, but it doesn't speak to us. It leaves us completely cold because it's a life created upon the values of society or maybe our parents or whoever else you know wants you to live a certain way um, but it's not connected to what we feel is most important our own values so that's also something i look at with my clients and then we go from there that seems to be something that i'm hearing like all the time at the moment is i'm stuck in a rut or i feel like i'm mm -hmm. in a rut mm -hmm. and I'm about 30 and like all my mates are sort of around that same age. So I guess we're all at this level where we went out and did what we were supposed to do. We, we got the job, we got the house, we got the dog. Some of us have the kids and we've gone tick, tick, tick and achieved it all. And now it feels like we're ready for the next stage, but we don't know what that is. And then that's a rut. Exactly. People obviously come to you, you know, once they're in a position where they recognize that something sort of not right in their life and they do need a little bit of help like not to plug skateboards or anything but how often do you find that the people that come to you are missing some form of like hobby or interest base in their life they are missing that little spark for something fun that's you know they're not grinding away trying to get to a goal they're they're just missing something that can give them a little bit of happiness and a little bit of relief from the monotonous nature of everything else that they're doing a significant proportion i can't give you any particular numbers because it really depends on also the the person or what we actually dive into um but i would almost say almost like most of them are definitely lacking that piece of passion because they find themselves in that hamster hamster wheel that we all kind of establish for ourselves but all of a sudden especially once you're like in your 30s or whatever and you might have the kids and all of a sudden all that happens monday to friday nine to five you're in your job and then before that and throughout and after you're trying to juggle kids and after school activities and all these things we need to do all the baby showers for friends and buying these presents and i don't even know uh, and then taking your kids to soccer matches on the weekend and all of a sudden there is no time for anything right we plan every minute of our day and there is no time left where we can actually take a breath sit down and think and i think it's because in our society so much worth or value is hinges upon accomplishment of some sort and being able to tell other people stories about all the things we've done and experienced or whatever that whole idea of just sitting down doing nothing is not appreciated right and we can't even talk about it and i barely know anyone who has that time where they sit down and do nothing but we need that time to breathe in order to pick up a hobby and just do the hobby for the sake of doing the hobby and not for the sake of coming out with a polished song that we've written or with you know the masterpiece of art we've come out with or something like that but 
just to almost waste time. It's it's called wasting time, right? Like, and that is a problem in and of itself. <laughs> it's considered as wasting time. But that is the most valuable time we can give to ourselves to spend time in our passions just for the sake of spending time in our passions without any measurable value coming out of it other than our experience. Yeah, it's an investment in yourself at the end of the day. And what you just said about time, we had a guest on here not that long ago called Prashant. Awesome dude. Um, he's probably mid thirties. He's got a family, he's got kids, he's got his own business. And he was looking at electric skateboards for literally years. Yeah. And he'd always tell himself, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. I got to work. I got to do this. I got to do that. One of his friends ended up getting a board and then he sort of got that peer pressure to, <laughs> to get into it. And he did get himself a board and it turns out he did have the time for it. <laughs> um, he just wasn't, allowing him that time because he didn't want to stray away from the things he was supposed to do which is respect to that like if you are a provider you do have a family you do have to do those things but you don't have to stick to that so strictly that you can't have any time for yourself and what's important with that as well is when you do allow yourself just that little bit you can invest in yourself and you can actually become a better person for those people around you like I can't speak for Prashant, <laughs> definitely not for his wife, but man, that dude is a happy man and I think his life balance is, is really quite good. Yeah. It's sad, isn't it? It's certainly something I experience with my clients all the time. It's that I don't have time. Well, here we are again talking about autonomy. Who has your time? And we, we always we strive towards financial wealth. Well, the biggest wealth you can work towards is time and freedom to spend the time however the hell you want to spend it. That is the wealth everyone should be striving for. Because that is when at the end of our days, when we're on our deathbed, we will say that life was freaking awesome. That was worth it. I had a hell of a ride. Changing gears a bit, um, the demographic of people that get on our boards are sort of like 25 to 40 year old men, predominantly. And to some people, mm -hmm. it seems a little bit silly that a 40 year old man would take up skateboarding for the first time. <laughs> um, I understand it. People correlate it with being dangerous. It is actually easier than you'd think. <laughs> My question um, is around what are the benefits and like what does it actually do to learn a brand new skill or develop a new skill set um, and experience that learning process i don't want to say later in life <laughs> be very careful here <laughs> um huge benefits obviously so we all know that you know we have this beautiful thing called brain plasticity right we used to think that you know our brains develop and by the age of i don't know 20 or so you know everything is done and dusted can't develop any further we know that that is completely um, outdated we know that our brains develop throughout the our entire lifespan but we also need to do something for that in order for that to happen use it or lose it they say right so even just from that perspective, it's super important we continue to challenge ourselves until the day we die. Sorry if I'm making this episode a bit morbid for you. <laughs> um, so use it or lose it. Super important to learn new skills. Now, as someone who's very uncoordinated myself, <laughs> I can only say that if you're older and you start learning a new, a new physical skill, for example, obviously, yeah, it d comes down to just try to not break anything fracture your arm or whatever so be a bit clever about it you know don't go into the biggest pipes just yet or whatever and wear protective gear that kind of stuff but um it's super important we continue to learn new skills and it doesn't matter how much you progress and what kind of level of accomplishment you reach with skating as long as you start it's not about a destination ever with any of these personal growth or development aspects or mental well-being we love the certainty of knowing you know there's a certain end goal or whatever and then i've accomplished that but everything is a continuum and we always slide along it that means anything we do is a journey it's not a destination so it's super important we just start and even if it takes baby steps well then so be it let it be baby steps it's still better than never starting it and at the end of the day regretting never having tried I love that. Like 
there is no destination to Eastgate. You just do it and you don't have to achieve anything. Um, we spoke the other day and you mentioned that you do snowboarding. Yeah, a little bit. Every now and then when I get a chance. <laughs> so that's not too far different to Eastgate. So when you go out, as someone who recognises all this stuff that's going on inside your brain, is there anything that you can recognise about snowboarding that ties into all these things that we've been talking about? Yeah, and, you know, maybe that's why I can speak for, from experience when I talk about this. Take baby steps. It's so worth it because I have to take the tiniest baby steps or had anyway when, when it comes to snowboarding because, as I mentioned to you before, I'm not experienced with any board sports or anything like that. I'm not super coordinated. Um, so, But I knew I wanted to try it. I knew, you know, trying skiing before. And by the way, I only learned those sports when after we moved to Australia. I had to move to Australia to learn those winter sports. Um, but... I knew skiing would come more natural to me, but I always loved just watching snowboarders. Um, so I decided just to give it a shot. And of course I landed on my butt so many times and I just learned to just take it really slow. And I think I also mentioned to you the other day, what my snowboard became to me is also very similar to a th therapist um, because it forces me to be mindful. And that's probably, one of the aspects of snowboarding I love the most because I have to be completely in the moment and tune into every part of my body and the board and the feeling of the board underneath my feet and the texture of the snow and so forth to be able to stay, stay on the board. As soon as my mind slips, just the tiniest bit, as soon as I, for example, doubt myself whether or not I can make it down this hill or pass that person, <laughs> I fall off. So for me, snowboarding is a mindfulness exercise. And so I can totally relate when you say your clients use skating as a form of therapy or to escape, you know, escape their minds or whatever, because it's such a beautiful experience. But yeah, I had to take absolute baby steps. But every time I stand on that board, I know it is so worth it. And the thing is, you will progress. You will progress. It's just not as fast as someone else might progress. But as you said, there is no destination. So it doesn't matter how fast you progress. It's all about the journey. Exactly. I've spent a lot of my career sort of within the realms of action sports. And I've worked with like all these top level dudes across skate, BMX, moto, you name it. And very often I've seen these kind of guys that, especially if you talk to them about their growing up, they haven't had a whole lot of luck at anything. They didn't, they didn't really gel well with school and all that sort of stuff. But once they found this, whatever they're doing, this passion, it sort of seemed to calm down that head noise or it made them feel happy or it gave them um, focus or it was able to hold attention, which nothing else could do. And once they found this thing that made them feel that way, they invested ludicrous amounts of time. And of course, once you're starting to put that much time into something, you become really good. Next minute, you're the world champion. Yeah. I think it's actually one of the myths about people with ADHD or ADD that they can't focus at all. They can focus. In fact, they can cultivate a hyper-focus as long as they do something that they're interested in, that where they feel passionate about, that they feel passionate about, and so forth, so they have the ability to create a, and actually a, a much better focus than people without that condition have. Um, but it's exactly what you said that single-minded focus that is so pleasurable, actually. We've lost the ability to just focus on one thing. You know, I was reading something the other day, some tips for mental health or whatever you know and it said avoid double screening and i just thought to myself the fact that we even need to say that because these days we don't just have one screen in front of us where we're watching a netflix show and i'm guilty myself in the other hand we hold our phone you know and then i know i can see my kids they triple screen sometimes it's so bad it's not good for our ability to focus on anything that's also why mindfulness has become such a key skill for anyone to learn these days because we've lost that ability to just focus on one thing straight away we become distracted our minds wander off into all these different realms and the thing is that research shows though that 
when we focus on just one thing, in particular, when we focus on what we're doing right here, right now, we have a, a higher level of happiness. It's one of the keys to happiness, momentary happiness, obviously not that eudaimonic happiness and also not that flourishing or mental well-being, but that, that um, hedonic type of happiness of just focusing on what you're doing, even if you're doing something that you don't actually enjoy so much, as long as you just immerse yourself in that activity, you will be happier than someone who doesn't. But we need to be able to do that. And we're kind of, we've kind of forgotten how to do that as a society since the rise of devices and so forth, right? I think the expectation um, of happiness how much you should have and when it should be is super yeah. tweaked out and a lot of that's because of social media it's not natural or normal to feel ecstatic all the time what are the levels of happiness that people should sort of work towards and that will set them up with a baseline for like that mental well-being so they're, they're in the positive without being ecstatic at every minute of the day yeah, exactly. So you already said momentary happiness. So first of all, we need to distinguish what type of happiness are we talking about? And this is one of the problems I think we have in society because we just say happiness. We have this one word, but we actually need, mean so many different things. What I distinguish at least is emotional well-being, which is more that hedonic type of happiness, which is the feeling of pleasure and joy. So that is that you know, when you share a nice meal with friends or when you are, you know, watching a funny YouTube video or whatever, right? So you can have this, this feeling of happiness and laughter and so forth. So that is hedonic happiness. But then there is this way deeper level of happiness, eudaimonic um, happiness, right? Or eudaimonia or also psychological well-being. So that's more when we feel like we're accomplishing things in life. We have a feeling of meaning and purpose and we're living life with intention and, and so forth. So often what's interesting, right, is that in order to create that eudaimonic type of happiness or psychological well-being of meaning and purpose and so forth, we actually need to sacrifice some of that hedonic well-being or hedonic happiness. Because so for example, let's say you know exactly that your life's purpose is to become a lawyer. Um, so you'll go to uni, met lots of years of uni and studying hard and so forth. What that means is that you will often have to say no to, um, you know, hedonic um, happiness moments of maybe going out with your friends or, you know, going to a party or I don't know, whatever that might be. So you'll often have to sacrifice hedonic happiness for the purpose of creating that eudaimonic type of happiness in your life of becoming a lawyer and living your life's purpose which will be deeply satisfying and fulfilling for you later on or probably also as you strive towards it but so this is a big distinction and we kind of think as though we just need to be happy all the time this is something called toxic positivity right we see this a lot certainly that's a very unhealthy way of looking at our own emotions and how we function as you mentioned it is not sustainable um, and it's not good to even think of that because at the end of the day our emotions are just like data right they're just pieces of information that provide us feedback they're like an internal feedback system to say hey you know what something is going really well right now i'm having lots of fun or you know there's something about the situation that is just not right, whether you are angry or whether you are sad, whether you're envious, whatever that might be. So here's some feedback for you. It is important we look at that and take that feedback on board. Otherwise, we will never grow as a person and understand what really matters, build relationships that matter, accomplish our goals and so forth. So we need to be very careful because our emotions, all emotions are important and valid. We need to look at them. We need to experience them. Otherwise, there won't be any personal growth. So now, obviously, the key is in finding somewhat of a balance. So when it comes to hedonic happiness or emotional well-being, yes, we do want probably more positive emotions in a day than negative ones. Otherwise, life will become really hard, right? Where's the motivation to get through this day and accomplish your goals if you just feel crap all the time? So that's where we need to also monitor that because otherwise it might go into a direction of anxiety or depression or those mental illnesses we spoke about earlier. So you probably want more positive emotions in a day than negative, but that's a rule of thumb and it really depends on what's going on for you currently in your life. Nothing is straightforward. No one day is the same as another. 
sometimes we just have to move through a tough slug. Do you know what I mean? So predominantly positive emotions, not so many negative emotions, if at all possible. But as I said, sometimes we actually have to sacrifice positive emotions in order to create a life that is actually deeply satisfying for us. Does that make sense? For sure. A good place probably to wrap this up is community. I know we touched on it before, but community is the heart and soul of Evolve and it has been since pretty much day one. I'll give you a little recap. Um, when we yeah. started back in 2009, we didn't send boards till about 2011, but we, we made 50 boards and we put them online and straight away, that was an international thing. So there, there was orders from Germany, UK, America, Australia, New Zealand. Wow. And there wasn't that many, 50 boards. But someone decided, hey, let's make a Facebook group. This is the earlier days of social media. And they made a Facebook group and started finding other people that had also bought the boards. And they started sharing their rides. They started talking. They started taking photos of the customization they'd done to it. They wanted to know what other people were doing. Um, they started finding more people and adding them in. And of course, as time went on, that group sort of got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, you know, sub branches of that group for more local areas to do rides. And that sort of organic accumulation of community <sighs> was definitely a big um, driving force behind Evolve getting bigger. And we obviously sort of like played into that. We would try and host group rides. We'd try and be the catalyst to get people together. And then by 2016 is when it w got sort of really crazy. We did the Evolve Riders World Cup in this little town in France. And by this stage, there was people in this group that had been talking almost daily for like five years. They were good friends, but they were all over the world. We gave them a reason to come together and suddenly these guys that had these intense bonds were able to come together in person. And like, honestly, it was it was magic. That's incredible. Like these guys were just best mates bonding over yeah. this, this weird little niche. It's just like a very intense bond that you don't see all the time. And from then, it's it's just exploded. I mean, that main group has tens of thousands of people in it now, and there's like hundreds and hundreds of subgroups. I'm talking Southeast Queensland riders, Chicago, New York, London, obscure little towns in Ireland that you've never heard of. And it's also tied into the wider uh, personal electric vehicle movement. Community is a big part of all this bikes, scooters, unicycles, all those things. When it comes to community, I know it's a little bit scary for people to – delve into something new but from your experience what have you seen when people do find those strong bonds in a situation where they're lacking a sense of community because I think if you do force yourself to follow a hobby you will find like-minded people well, d are people afraid to do that? Uh, obviously, it depends on the person. Some people are a little bit more sort of group people than others. But it's actually, it opens the door for that social well-being we spoke about earlier. Community is so important and to combine it. And by the way, I had goosebumps when you told me that story. I think it's phenomenal and I love it. Um, community is so important especially when you can c combine it or when it's a community around one of your hobbies or passion projects or whatever you want to call that because there are so many aspects of mental health and well-being that come together here and give you an opportunity to cultivate and live that so for example not only that social connection right but it's also it's a very positive group right where you all share your passion that one passion or at least an aspect of that same passion. And you can have chats about it, but you can also, you will learn from others. And at the same time, others, some others will learn from you. So not only do you have a chance of growing and mastering that skill even further, but also you have an opportunity to give back to a community and have a feeling of accomplishment. And, you know, it, it gives you that, it's basically those acts of kindness, which we know increases our own happiness as well. So there are so many different aspects of flourishing or mental well-being um, that come together. And just j sharing that passion of yours with other people will also bring us that those moments of joy and hedonic happiness or whatever. So having a community around your hobby like skating is amazing and being able to share that with others. That's your mental well-being right there. <laughs> it's super interesting to tie that into the groups is 
not only getting help yourself but being able to help other people that gives yourself like that sense of purpose oh absolutely you want to if you want to boost your own happiness do something good for others or even you know there are studies to show if you want to spend your money in a way that makes you happy spend it on others it's called pro-social spending doing random acts of kindness for others or spending your money on others will make you happier it's just one of those things we just have to get in our own heads um and the amount of money you spend doesn't matter by the way um but yeah oh well thank you so much for coming on here it's been crazy insightful hearing all these things from your perspective and just me listening to you i'm picking up on this relates to this and this relates to this and i know the writers out there are going to be exactly the same so we'll chuck all the links to to your socials and stuff there so if people want to get in touch or just learn a little bit more about what you do it's all there thank you again for coming on board and sharing everything that you know yeah maddie it's been such a pleasure chatting with you i love what you've created what you're doing with evolve and yeah i feel absolutely honored that you've had me on the show thank you so much it's been a great chat Thanks for watching guys. All her links are straight below and thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.